We are honored to have uh, Dr. Ravi Zacharias with us today. This morning as we were setting up some chairs for a little roundtable discussion with the uh, religious education, some of our religious education faculty, the receptionists that were helping me set up the chairs, they said, well, tell us about this special guest we have. And uh, for BYU students, they, they may not realize how big this is. And so I'm trying to figure out how they could relate to, to this in a way that that would help them to understand how significant uh, a guest and a lecture we have today. I said, well, he's kind of like a younger Billy Graham. And so we are really, really pleased to have one of the great defenders of the Christian faith and one of the cr great uh, uh, Christian apologists. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ravi Zacharias uh, was born in India, emigrated to Canada, and uh, is one of the great American religious leaders. He's a defender of traditional Christian evangelicalism and the author of numerous Christian books, including award-winning books. We are uh, pleased to also tell you that he is a defender, a great defender of, uh, of human life, the sanctity of human life, the dignity of marriage as a union between uh, husband and wife, and the religion, uh, the freedom of religion, and the foundational principles of justice and common good. We are grateful to be able to lock arms with friends and, and uh, men and women of like-minded values, and so we are honored to have uh, Ravi uh, Zacharias here as one of our speakers in the series of Faith, Family, and Society. He is also... Uh, uh, Ravi is also presently, in addition to the president and founder of the Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, he is also a senior research fellow at Wycliffe Hall at Oxford University in Oxford, England. Dr. Zacharias has spoken to uh, religious leaders, students, faculty, business people, uh, philosophers, uh, religious leaders around the world in speaking on those important values of our day. And so let us, with a BYU welcome, welcome Ravi Zacharias and his wife Margie to our campus. Thank you. Well, it's a real honor to be here, and thank you, Brent, for that kind and warm welcome. I have several of my colleagues and several friends here as well. <clears throat> In a sense, it's a kind of a disappointment to me that I have to speak right now because we've had a wonderful morning so far, just engaging the faculty and then visiting your library and then uh, just having a little bit of time with Sandy in her office and uh, then the horrific reminder that I still have to speak. So that's the unfortunate part of it, but that's why a meal is called from soup to nuts. You move to the nuts part of it at the end, and this is my responsibility. But I want to thank all of your leadership for welcoming me here. It's very hard to believe that it was 20 years ago when under your Department of Philosophy and Dr. David Paulson, I had the privilege of being here, so some of you may not even have been around <clears throat> at that time. But the wonderful thing is to be introduced after so many years as a younger somebody. That in itself is a great compliment. I would love to come back just for that introduction. I, I remember when I was speaking for Billy Graham actually in 1987, so I was in my 30s for the first uh, Amsterdam 86, I guess it was. Uh, one young uh, apologist evangelist came up to me and he began his question with, as an older man, what kind of advice would he? I gave him no advice after that. <clears throat> I just wanted him to know what older actually meant. But that was 20 some uh, years ago and now you begin to feel like you're related to Alexander the Great and you may as well face up to it. You know, we've been here invited under the broader theme of uh, liberty, faith, family, and so on, religious freedom. Uh, I have chosen two particular subjects that will come under that umbrella, albeit at a tangent, at an angle. But if you really go back to think about it after the talks, I think you will find they're very germane to the assumption we are really making on faith, family, and freedom. 
It was some years ago that I was invited to speak at Johns Hopkins University. And there was a series of speakers uh, that were going to address the theme. And I, along with Francis Collins, uh, was asked to speak uh, from a Judeo-Christian vantage point, from the Christian vantage point. And the theme assigned at that time was, what does it mean to be human? And of course, we were hearing perspectives and counter perspectives and hostile perspectives, adversarial ideas, and so on. And I remember Francis Collins finished his talk from a scientific perspective, and uh, at the end of it, he did something extraordinary. If any one of you tracked those series, I don't know, but he uh, put up on the screen, on a split screen, he put up two slides. On the first side of it, which he exposed, he showed a beautiful piece of work of stained glass window from the Yorkminster Cathedral in England. And all these thousands of pieces and their magnificent colors, and people were just taken aback by the beauty of it. And he talked about the designer and the design and all of that. And he said, what you're looking at is uh, a slide of uh, a picture of uh, the Yorkminster Cathedral window, stained glass window. Then he moved the covering aside and showed the next slide, which is even more spectacular. And people were wowed by what they were seeing, but they didn't know what it was. He said, what you're looking at is at a vertical section of the human DNA. The blueprint for life. And of course, he, along with his colleague, had done the human genome product. And it was extraordinary to take a look at it, even more spectacular than an ordinary stained glass window. What did Francis Collins do after that as people were just in rapt attention over the picture? He took out his guitar and sang a song of worship. And he came and sat next to me, and he tapped me on the knee, and he said, go for it. <laughs> and it was my turn on next. So I felt a bit anticlimactic then, and here I'm not quite sure what I will do to better that. But let me move to something lighthearted and then on to my talk. The story is told of these two Aussies, Australian uh, sailors, who had gotten off a ship in London and walked into a dense London fog. And they made their way to a British pub and enjoyed what they could, and after a heavy dose of liquid refreshment, uh, walked out of there into this fog and couldn't find their way around. So one of the guys was looking at the other and not too steady on their feet. They saw a highly decorated naval officer, an English officer, coming in, but they couldn't see all the medals flashing and all. So one of the Aussies said to him, Say, you bloke, can you tell us where we are? And the naval officer, rather offended, looked at them and said, do you men know who I am? And one Aussie looked at the other and said, we are really in a mess now. We don't know where we are, and he doesn't know who he is. <laughs> <clears throat> Have you ever pondered, when you even select a theme at a university as they did, to call it, what does it mean to be human? If we did not know what it meant to be human, what did it do to all of the volumes written on humanism? What was this ism really representing? What does it mean to be a human being? Ironically, a thousand years before Christ, David penned these words, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You've put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When you look at all of the glory of the heavens and all those marvels that evoke that sense of wonder, from the simple beauty that you may take for granted as you look at the peaks just outside this building, 
to the marvel of a little child from whose lips he has ordained praise. Whether it's a tiny little life you hold or the majesty of physical creation around, we all ask the question, what is there in man that you're mindful of him? Why do you even take notice of this, things that we, this thing that we call homo sapiens? A marvelous question over 3,000 years ago, and the question still remains. I want to give to you the Christian answer to this question and remind you how important it is that we actually understand how critical these definitions are. If you ask me what has been the loss in our time, I think truly it has been the loss of definitions. We do not know how to define good. We do not know how to define evil. We do not know how to define what it means to be human. We do not know how to define the sacredness of sexuality. We do not know what it means anymore to call a family a family or a home. We do not know how to have an ontic referent for purpose, meaning, destiny, all of these things. And yet we supposedly have come of age so that we refer to ourselves as postmodern. Modern wasn't good enough, wasn't good enough to be contemporary. We are after what is. That's the way we have arrived at this scene. It is fascinating to me that the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who lived between 1844 and 1900, died at the age of 56. His musings on the meaning of existence. Ironically, his father was a pastor. Both of his grandfathers on mother's side, father's side, were in Christian ministry. And yet Nietzsche lost his belief in God. And uh, walking out of a brothel once, even looked at a piano and talked about it having a soul much more than he himself did. And he talked about the death of God and ultimately when it would dawn on humanity that God had died and this supreme idea so great that had defined everything had now been removed, we would suddenly have to come to terms with new definitions. Will we not lead lan need lanterns in the morning hours to light our path? Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? Is there any up? or down left. He was looking for new definitions. What sacred games will we need to invent to somehow satisfy this spiritual hunger within us? And yet Nietzsche himself made that ironic prognostication that if God had indeed died philosophically in the 19th century, two things would happen in the 20th century, said he. He said, number one, it would become the bloodiest century in history. And number two, a universal madness would break out. He was right on both counts. In the 20th century, we killed more people in battle and on the battlefield than the previous 19 put together. And Nietzsche himself spent the last 13 years of his life insane, silent for weeks on end. And then, in what had to have stirred his mother's heart, when he would suddenly burst into some kind of speech, more often than not, it would be a verse of scripture that he'd memorized as a younger man. What games will we need to invent? Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the horizon? Is there any up or down left? Our definitions are gone. And you see, the fact of the matter is right at the garden when the challenge came. In the day that you eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, you shall be as God. You will play God. And that's precisely what happened. We redefined everything. As my professor Norman Geisler used to say, the problem was not the apple on the tree, it was the pear on the ground. These two who decided to redefine everything for us. How do we define what it means to be human today? The Christian worldview gives us these four realities. The first one is this, that we are here not by accident. We are here from the mind and design of a creator. This starting point is the starting point that really takes us to move in the direction of the sacredness of our origin and the sacredness of the purpose of life and the ultimate destiny. When I read uh, philosophers or scientists who try to explain to us 
why science has now done away with the need for God and an explanation of a, of a creator. And so people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and Daniel Dennett and uh, Sam Harris make this sound so profound that we no longer need a creator because science has done away with the need for a creator. The grand design by Stephen Hawking has that audacious statement that the law of gravity now explains everything. What philosophical thinking goes into that kind of a statement? Really? That's why the philosophers at Cambridge took him on. We didn't even need the theologians to challenge him. And the chairman of the philosophy department took that book to task and Hawking's rather audacious claims. Here's another agnostic, a man by the name of David Berlinsky, responding to Richard Dawkins in, the, in his book, The God Delusion. Here's Berlinsky who writes The Devil's Delusion in response to Dawkins, a self-claimed agnostic. Here's what it says on the flap of the book, the flap cover of the book. Here's what Berlinsky says. Has anyone provided a proof of God's inexistence? Not even close. Has quantum cosmology explained the emergence of the universe or why it is here? Not even close. Have the sciences explained why our universe seems to be fine-tuned to allow for the existence of life? Not even close. Are physicists and biologists willing to believe in anything so long as it is not religious thought? Close enough. Has rationalism and moral thought provided us with an understanding of what is good, what is right, and what is moral? Not close enough. Has secularism in the terrible 20th century been a force for good? Not even close to being close. Is there a narrow and oppressive orthodoxy of thought and opinion within the sciences? Close enough. Does anything in the sciences or in the philosophy justify the claim that religious belief is irrational? Not even in the ballpark. Is scientific atheism a frivolous exercise in intellectual contempt? Dead on. This is Berlinsky. He's not trying to argue for any religious perspective. He is just so taken aback by the stridency of these anti-theistic thinkers who have taken the single finger of science and think they have grabbed the whole fist of reality. That's why even people like Sir Frederick Hoyle, along with his partner Chandra Vikramasinghe, who did work, Chandra Vikramasinghe from the University of Cardiff, the Sri Lankan scientist, who did his work on the enzymatic makeup of the human body, went on to make this comment. He said the possibility of the enzymes within the human body, which are the very basis of our life, of this coming together by accident is so remote as much as one in 10 to the 40,000th power. This is a Buddhist thinker. Buddhists are non-theists, but even he goes to the extent of saying just taking the biochemical makeup of the human body, the mathematical impossibility of what we are seeing. So Frederick Hoyle, his, um, in collusion with him in writing the book, ends up saying, so we still have to explain how did this all come to be. And so Sir Frederick Hoyle goes for the panspermian theory that a spaceship from another planet brought some spores to seed the earth and that's what got it all started and they tell us we have faith <laughs> can you imagine an astronomer of his stature sir francis crick also who cracked the code of the dna subscribes to the panspermian theory don't ask them who made the spaceship <laughs> from whence did it all come? He has made you as the work of his hands. He is the Lord of design. He is the Lord of creator. Uh, the Lord is the creator. When I see the heavens and the work of your hands, there are two implications from the creation narrative. Number one, it gives to you and me intrinsic worth. This is not extrinsic worth given by the state or by some will of some political theory. This is intrinsic worth. You have essential value before God. That intrinsic worth was shown to us by Jesus in a very simple statement. You see, Moses gave us 613 laws. Pretty tough. Why is it tough? Because they violated one. 
when you violate the first law not to play God, you need hundreds of laws to keep us in check. So when you get onto a plane, what do they tell you? Don't touch, tamper, disable, or destroy the smoke detector. It could have been put in one statement, don't mess with this. Why touch, tamper, disable, or destroy? Because in a court, each one of those words can die the death of a thousand qualifications. That's why. Moses gave them 613. David reduced it to 15. Isaiah reduced it to 11. Micah reduced it to 3. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. So this man comes to Jesus and says, which is the greatest commandment? Isn't it fascinating Jesus didn't reduce it to one? He said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind, and all your soul, and all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all of the laws and the prophets. Because of the first, the second follows. Without the first, the second is with its feet firmly planted in midair. It is the anchoring to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, that you are essentially a creature who is a sacred entity and your neighbor as well. So it is not just that the Ten Commandments talk about your life and your protection, but it also gives that same sacredness to your neighbor, to his family, to his sexuality, to his property, to his word, to his worship, that this, on these two, hang all of the commandments, even the 600 that ultimately Moses had to give to them. You take away these two, and you're creating a world of anarchy, unable to sustain initial value and initial worth, that intrinsic worth that God gives to you and to me. This is what we've lost in our time. We've lie is running around, and she tells us the story that because she was in her 40s when she got in this unexpected pregnancy, the doctor told her, serious problems, serious complications, you have to remove this baby. She pleaded with him, no, no, I want to carry this child. The doctor said, no, I'm not going to deliver this baby, serious problem. She left the doctor and went and found somebody else, delivered this little boy. Let me tell you about him. He was, uh, was running around the house while Patricia was visiting with us, and he comes to her and he says, Mommy, God spoke to me today. She said, he did? She said, what did he say? He told me that you and I should have lunch at Burger King. <laughs> and Patricia, carrying on, said, God really told you that? She said, yeah. He said, yeah, I think he told me that. She said, well, God hasn't told me that. So he departs rather downcast, comes back a minute later. Does God always have to confirm with somebody else what he has told you? This boy was five. <laughs> and on one occasion, he's sitting at the back of our car. And he's, his mother is, you know, all dressed up for the evening. And so he looks at his dad and he says, Daddy, doesn't mommy look beautiful today? And so like a typical middle-aged typical middle guy looks and says, yeah, she looks very good today. He says, no, 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 Daddy. This is not anybody, this is your wife. <laughs> look at her nicely and say, Patricia, you look beautiful today. <laughs> this boy is so far ahead of the game, he's already received two double promotions going on his way, fluent in English and Spanish. A boy that a doctor thought he knew so much, he was going to eradicate before he saw the light of day. When she went to visit the doctor with her son, do you know, he didn't come out to meet the little boy. It's better to block your mind from the visual reality, isn't it? I've often thought of it in these terms, friends, and forgive me for treading on such controversial areas at my stage in life. I've gotten used to it now. But the whole reality, as I say, if we talk about the problem of power, suffering, pain and all, I'm often wondering this when we stand before God and say to him, Lord, so many died of cancer, so many died of this disease and that disease, why didn't you do anything? What would ever happen if God said, you know, I sent so many knowledgeable and intelligent people to help you along in this, you never even allowed them into your world. 
We think we know so much. We do not know yet how to give human life intrinsic value. Time's fleeting by, so let me move to the next. Not only does this give you intrinsic worth, it gives you particular value in relationships. Particular value in relationships. So it gives you this cosmic scene of every life being valuable in that macrocosmic setting, but that microcosmic thrill of having a home, having a family, having those relationships, having people who care for you and love you, because you are their own offspring of flesh and blood. You know, my son graduated from Taylor University. In 2006, a dreadful tragedy struck that campus. Some of their students in a van and one or two others following along were coming back at the end of a weekend. And uh, a huge truck in the opposite direction crossed over the median, rammed into one of them. And just about all of them were killed in that van, except for, I think, one student and maybe a staff member or something. It hit the wires, and my son had already graduated, and we were reading about it. And it's a kind of a nightmare of a parent who sent their kids off to school to get a telephone call like that. All these kids killed, except one of them. Laura Van Rin was lying in her bed. And uh, the parents came, and she was all beaten up, hair matted face so distended and all uncomfortable, blood marks and all. And the parents just stood by her bedside day after day after day. Her boyfriend was there too. They'd keep talking to her. And finally, as she started to make more sense, she would say, I don't know why you keep calling me Laura. I'm not Laura. The boyfriend said to the parents, this doesn't sound like uh, Laura to me. They said, what do you expect? Brain damage and head and all. She said, no, something is wrong. Finally, she became very coherent, and she said, I am not Laura. My name is Whitney. Why do you keep calling me Laura? So they contacted the officers of the university and said, was there anybody by the name of Whitney in the van? They said, yes, there was a Whitney Serac, but she was buried already shortly after the accident. They said, we've got news for you. The girl here keeps saying she's Whitney. They contacted the coroner. Did you do any DNA testing after that? He said, no. He lost his job over it. What he thought, who he thought was Laura, was actually Whitney. And Whitney's parents had buried her, thinking they were burying their daughter. They had actually buried the Van Rin daughter, Laura Van Rin. So one set of family picks up their bags and heads to the grave. Another set of family comes back. The Sirac family comes and stands by the bedside and says, I can't believe you're still alive, Whitney. She said she's the only one probably for a long time who will hear the sermons of her own funeral. She went back and played the sermon and all, and they thought they were really bearing it. You see, there is a particularity to your life. There is a particular value. And God entrusts this value within families and within relationships. And we are meant to make it with their supporting arms, with their sustaining arms. But these definitions are con. I would never have made it at the age of 17 when I was in Delhi growing up with no meaning and on a bed of suicide, trying to take my own life. Till the word of God was brought to me and my mother who hardly understood any of it speaking in her struggling English reading from the King James given that Bible and read to me and I found Christ I've always felt that debt of gratitude to my mother who even without her understanding was by my bedside day after day after day till we buried her when she was 57 and my father gave me the honor of preaching at her funeral because of all that she meant to me and being the one from whom that word of God came at that point she didn't even understand it took her years later to come to an understanding God has given us that unique privilege of having intrinsic worth and particular value that's why we radiate and reflect that glory because of time fleeting I will move quickly first is creation second is the incarnation 
Paul in Philippians 2 talking about Jesus and gives us what was an ancient hymn that probably predated the Pauline writing itself. Here's this man, of course, Saul of Tarsus, who was keeping watch on the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen to death. Now in that dramatic uh, encounter on the Damascus Road, Saul of Tarsus becomes the great apostle Paul and gives to us one third of the New Testament. He gives us this in Philippians 2, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has exalted him and given to him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And interestingly, how Isaiah presents him, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The son is not born, the son eternally existed. It is the child that is born, the son is given. The wonderful counsel of the mighty God, the everlasting father, the title is given to him. Here is Paul taking that early gospel in a hymn, thinking of robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation. What does this tell you and me? Number one, it gives me the absoluteness of the moral law. There is the absoluteness of the moral law when we talk of the incarnation. And I'll move beyond it. But here's what I want to say to you. Naturalist thinkers, secular thinkers, anti-theistic thinkers have tried desperately to form a pattern of giving rational positioning to moral reasoning and they have failed across time in trying to give you a rationally compelling basis for morality. Sam Harris just made a valiant effort in his recent book and this student of neuroscience, what does he do? He tells moral reasoning is the same as well-being and in his circular reasoning he goes on and on repeating the same terms. No rational compulsion on why moral reasoning has its ontic reference has its absolute. But the Bible reminds us how much this is part of being in the image of God. Here's Canadian atheist Kai Nielsen conceding this point. We have not been able to show that reason requires us to have a moral point of view or that really rational persons unhoodwinked by myth or ideology need not be individual egoists or classical amoralists. Did you listen to that line? Really rational persons unhoodwinked, what a word, unhoodwinked by myth or ideology. In other words, if you're hoodwinked by myth or ideology, you can give yourself some reason to be good. But if you're unhoodwinked by myth or ideology, you can have nothing to keep you from becoming an egotist. That's exactly what he says. He says we have no basis for that. So let me read it for you again. He says this, uh, the moral point of view of that really rational persons unhoodwinked by myth or ideology need not be individual egoists or classical amoralists. Reason doesn't decide here. The picture I have painted for you is not a pleasant one. Reflection on it actually depresses me. Pure practical reason, even with a good knowledge of the facts, will not take you to morality. Wow. Reason alone will not take you to morality. Here's Richard Rorty. If moral imperatives are not commanded by God's will, and if they are not in some sense absolute, then what ought to be is really a matter simply of what men and women decide should be. There is no other source of judgment. There's no other source of judgment. Allow me to be a little facetious for a moment. But uh, Richard Dawkins, the guru of atheism, I want to position two comments of his. One took place in a live interview over the BBC, and did he ever stumble upon his words? He's being interviewed by the dean of St. Paul's, uh, maybe the present dean of the past. And so he's mocking Christians. He says, oh, most Christians don't, can't even name the Gospels for you. And so the dean says to him, Richard, your Bible is Darwin's origin of species, isn't it? He said, that's right. He said, Richard, could you name the full title of the book? And Dawkins says, yeah, I know, I know it's a long title. He said, go ahead, name it. 
So Dawkins is alive. Goes on to say, well, it says the origin of species. Um, um, oh my God, I can't remember the rest of it, he says. Even an atheist had to call upon the name of God to remind him of the title of a book because of which he lost belief in God, to remind him of what the title was. If that's not irony, I don't know what is. <laughs> and then he comes to Washington, and he's speaking to the masses, and one of them asks him a question. What do we do with those who have religious belief? Here's Dawkins' exact comment. Mock him. Mock him. So somebody in an open forum asked me, what do you think of that statement? So allow me to be facetious here. I said, I agree with him. And I think he should go on a mocking tour and start off in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I said, the good news for him is he won't need a return ticket, just one way will all that he'll need. <laughs> really? Mock them? Mock them? Is that really what we learn when we ultimately depend upon our own definitions of absolutes? This is the havoc of recognizing that in the incarnation, if we don't recognize the incarnation, we lose the moral law. But number two, what follows? The supremacy of love. The absoluteness of the moral law and the supremacy of love. Isn't that beautiful? And now I give to you the three excellencies, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. C.S. Lewis talks about the four kinds of love. You've got agape, God's love. You've got storge, parental love. You've got phileo, brotherly love. You've got eros, romantic love. These other three of storge, phileo, and eros have no point of reference unless you grant the first, which is agape. The love of God himself. That's why parents in the face of all opposition keep loving and loving and loving and loving because it is the supreme expression of what God has poured into their hearts to love, particularly their very own offspring. I bring to you the creation and its implications, intrinsic worth, reflective splendor, the incarnation, absoluteness of the moral law and supremacy of love. Thirdly, transformation, that the human heart needs the new birth. He said it to one of the most religiously knowledgeable of all, to Nicodemus, who didn't understand it. He said, don't you know, this is what the Holy Spirit brings within you, that new birth that changes not only what you do, but changes what you want to do having dinner with some of the leadership last night and all of their graciousness. I was sharing with them an experience that I had in uh, Angola. Maybe it was not at the dinner, maybe it was the press report, I forget. You know, when you talk to so many people, you forget what you said, where, when and where. My wife says, when Ravi says recently, what he means is he just thought about it. And uh, <laughs> I was speaking a little over a year ago in the bloodiest prison in America, in Louisiana, it's known as Angola prison. 85% of them are on life without parole. When you were admitted as an inmate into Angola, you were given a knife to protect yourself. 45 are on death row. I went with some friends of mine, or because of the invitation we went, and one of them was the basketball coach, I think of Virginia Tech, or the chaplain. There were athletes there, about five or six of us. And I was asked to speak first to the prisoners who are now part of a seminary program and then to a joint plenary group out of which it was 700 in attendance and piped into every cell. Walking past death row, I put my hand through the bars and shake hands with some of them. You know they, what they'd be reading? They'd be reading writers like R.C. Sproul and Chuck Swindoll. One of them held my book in his hand and said, would you please sign this for me, sir, on death row. And you look at them and you walk away and say, it must be a miniature hell in this world to live that way. But you know, every cell has a Bible. The warden, the girth of a southern sheriff, 
came in and did it his own way. A Bible in every cell, chapel regularly, seminary, Bible studies. It has become the safest prison in America. And I looked at one of those men who led in the worship before I left and to see that altar full of people. You just go and hug these guys and see the tears in their eyes. I don't know, all the regrets. And this guy just came to bid me goodbye, gave me a big hug. I said, are you here on life as well? He said, yeah. I said, do you mind my asking you, how does it feel? When you know you're not going to walk out of here again. I said, I just, just want to hear your emotions on that. He said, Mrs. Zacharias, if you knew the kind of man I was before I got here, if this is what it took for me to find my ultimate freedom because of what Jesus Christ has done in my life, I'm okay living within these walls for the rest of my life because of the freedom I now have inside. Pray for my parents. Pray for those outside who think they're actually free but don't really have the Savior and don't have their freedom. Wow. So from creation to the incarnation, you move to transformation, which God's power alone is able to do. I mentioned to you one more thought and move to my final one. You know, Mahatma Gandhi always traveled with the New Testament in his bag. He read an awful lot. He considered the Sermon on the Mount the greatest sermon he'd ever read. But because of all the apartheid in South Africa and so on, he'd lost his faith in any Christian claims anyway. But Gandhi had a high reverence for Christ. And in his home in Ahmedabad, I saw a banner that caught me completely off guard. It was a statement by Bertrand Russell. And the banner says this in Gandhiji's home. So here's what it says. It is doubtful that the Mahatma would have succeeded, except he was appealing to the conscience of a Christianized people. This is Bertrand Russell. So I said, wow, this is an atheist applauding the work of a pantheist, saying he only succeeded because of a theistic framework. It's doubtful that he would have succeeded, except he was appealing to the conscience of a Christianized people. It's just a fascinating reality of what God does in the transformation of a heart, in the regeneration that only God is big enough to bring. That is the hope for which we all long, the hope for which we all pray. So you move from creation to incarnation to transformation, finally to consummation. The hope that awaits us when all of diversity will be pulled together in unity in the unity of expression of worship before the living God. Augustine was right. He has made us for himself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. And so what we face now is unity and in diversity now when we come to know Christ, but diversity in community then when we get to heaven, where people of every tongue and tribe and language will be at the feet of Christ, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. That's the consummate moment with perpetual novelty. The great football coach, Lou Little, tells the story, and I'm done with that. He talked about this football player who was on his team and was always a second stringer, so never quite made it. But he would often see this young man with his father's arm and his walking around the campus and the first son would be describing the buildings. One day this young guy came to the coach and coach said, get Coach Lou, my father's passed away. I won't be here this weekend. Can I get a leave of absence for my dad's funeral? He said, that's fine. So he goes for the funeral and comes back. And he comes to the coach. He says, I've never asked you to do me this favor. Please let me play this weekend's game. Coach said, I can't let you do it. There's a better player than you. He said, if I'm not playing the best man on the field, you pull me out. Just give me a chance. So knowing of the tragedy of his dad's death, he gave him the chance. By far, he was the best man on the field, so he kept him in. So after it's over in the wind, he's putting his arm around this young guy, and he says, you did that for your dad, didn't you? He said, yes, sir, but you don't understand the reason below. He said, my dad was blind, and this was the first time he was going to be able to watch me play. The songwriter says, heaven above is softer blue, earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue, Christless eyes have never seen. 
birds with gladder songs o'erflow, stars with deeper beauty shine, since I know, as now I know, I am his and he is mine. The world has become a lonely place, but the world is looking for answers. When you carry the message of what it means to be human, as given to us in our Christian worldview, you give them the answers from the creation, the incarnation, to transformation, to consummation. What is there in man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you visit him? He has made us in his image. And that image puts us on a plane that is very unique and gives that moral framework and self-determination privilege within us. I want to thank you all for having me here. You've been very gracious. Thank you so much for the privilege. And may God richly bless you. Thanks for giving me a hearing. Thank you.